Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining this evening's webinar on the changing landscape of highly selective colleges. Um, we'd College Match Room would like to welcome you joining us this evening, and presenting is Lisa Bain Carlton, the founder and CEO of College Match Point, myself, Bob Carlton, and Virginia Woodruff, who's on our team. And we'd like to welcome you and thank you for taking time out of your evening to join us. Uh, a couple of logistics on this evening's webinar. Please feel free to share questions as the webinar goes on in terms of uh, yourself or your student. Um, if you can use the Q&A box, it, it'll be easier and we'll be taking a pause at the end of each section to field any questions. And then um, after the webinar tomorrow, we'll be sharing a video recording of the webinar for reference or for anyone you'd like to share it with. So um, a little background on College Match Point. Many of you know us, but our team has worked for the last 12 years with um, countless students who were admitted to highly selective colleges. This evening, we'll be focusing on four topics, what a highly selective college looks for, how to achieve depth in terms of activities, what is an application strategy, why is an application strategy important? And then finally, what is changing? And we somewhat humorously noted that this is what is changing as of 6 p.m. Central Time today. Because sure enough, while we're on this webinar, some college may announce that they've gone to test optional, test blind, the ACT may announce, as they did a couple of hours ago, that they won't be allowing students to do sectional retakes of the ACT, but they will be submitting super score test results. The landscape is changing at a rate that is almost unprecedented in college admissions. So this evening, we'll try to give you a snapshot of what's changed so far and some sense of what might be ahead. Now, um, as a starting point, what exactly makes a college highly selective? Well, less than 3% of colleges in the United States could be considered highly selective. These are typically schools with an admissions rate below 20%. And you can see in this table a number of key schools that fit that criteria. And their admissions rates, while they may change somewhat year to year, tend to stay in that band of either under 10% or under 20%. You also see that many of these schools offer early decisions at MIPS rates. The classic definition of a highly selective school would be a school like Stanford, which is so selective, it no longer publishes its admissions rate. So beyond the math, the numbers of admissions rates, what are the other aspects that make a school highly selective? The second aspect, is what some colleges refer to as cultural norms. Um, they're applying to a school either because they're a leg legacy, because of the school's resources or the student body. They typically are not factoring in distance from home. These are typically not students who are staying close in to Texas or are going to geographical areas that their families may have relocated from here to Texas. The third aspect is an aspect of um, what is, quite frankly, marketing. Uh, earlier this spring, the Wall Street Journal had an extensive article that spotlighted uh, Vanderbilt and their fairly aggressive marketing tactics to make sure that they can increase the number of applicants to their school so that the school becomes even more selective and it allows them to then cherry pick the students that best fit their criteria. And this is oftentimes started when a student takes the PSAT. Um, the college board markets that contact information and it oftentimes triggers all those wonderful four color brochures that um, uh, crowd your mailbox. And then the last aspect of why highly selective colleges have maintained or become even more competitive is the growth of the Common App. Um, as the Common App came online, the average number of schools that students applied to more than doubled from four to nine schools. And we found in our work with students who apply to highly selective schools, 
that it's not unusual for a student who includes highly selective schools on her list to sometimes apply to 12 to 14 schools. A little later, we'll talk about the implications of that for the application strategy. But again, just as a level set, only 3% of colleges in the United States would classically be referred to as highly selective. Now, Lisa's gonna take us through what highly selective colleges look for. Hi, everybody. Thank you again, as Bob said, for joining us. And we're excited to talk about this. So when we think about what school colleges look for in general, and especially highly selective colleges, we kind of break this down into a number of parts. Obviously, this is for school. So the first most important thing is academics, always. They're going to look at a student's transcript and they're gonna look at a student's test scores. And I always say to Bob that our, our graphic designer, really, we should redo this a little bit. The transcript is about actually about twice as important as the test scores. And we'll talk about COVID-19 and impact there. Now, when I say transcript, there's a few things I want you to think about. Obviously, the first thing is just what are the grades on the transcript? And the reality is that for highly selective school, the majority of those grades need to be A's. Like there can be a B or, but the, a lot, it can't be an even number of A's and B's in highly selective schools. It's definitely mostly A's. And then the other thing that they're looking at is what kind of classes did the student take? How much did the student challenge himself? How much did they take the extra classes, the AP classes, the IB classes, whatever is available at their school? Now, if a school doesn't have that, what other ways did a student work to build rigor into their, into their coursework? So it's both the grades received and the rigor mixed together is how a college is evaluating that transcript. In addition to that, they are looking at test scores. Later we'll talk about kind of the situation that we're in right now, but in general, and when I talk about test scores, at least in the Ivy Leagues, you still have to have those subject tests. Now this year that's gonna be different, but in general, when we think about what are kind of some of the things that make a student um, particularly attractive to a college, Subject test scores over 730, 750 are really kind of expected. So those are the academic piece. So that's the first thing they're going to look at. And that's gonna be probably the majority of the first read of a student's application. So then when we kind of think a second read, that's a second admissions person looking at that application, then probably everybody was somewhat similar in their academics, not totally. And it, it might come down to going back and looking at, well, this one took these or whatever, but a lot of the decision then comes down to what's on a student's resume, what are their essays like, what are their recommendations like, what special talents do they bring to my school that might be an addition to our community, and have they shown interest in our college? And so if we take all of that together, that's how a student at a highly selective school is read. And a few years ago, I had a wonderful young man who I believe he had a 36 out the gate on his ACT. And the first time we met, he said, I wanna let you know something. And I said, sure. And he said, I wanna let you know that I'm going to have the colleges look at me just on my test scores and not my transcript. And I was like, well, that would be awesome if we could do that, but actually they're taking the whole thing into account. So when we're looking at it, and this is, I think, when, we, when you look at how selective these schools are, and of course, one of the things Bob and I wanna say is there's a lot of other fantastic colleges out there, even though we're talking about highly selective, the, the amount that a student's got to be able to check off these boxes is not insignificant in a highly selective school. What are the hurdles that a student has to have? Most students who are accepted into highly selective schools are going to be in the top 10% of their class. Now, if you guys were sitting in a room, someone would raise their hand and say, but my school doesn't rank, so they won't know. Schools don't rank, but high schools provide profiles, and those profiles show 
will give the college a pretty good indicator of where students with different GPAs are falling in terms of ranking. So it's pretty easy for an admissions rep who's trained to have a pretty good idea of where the student is falling. But in general, top 10% is, is, is what you're kind of eyeing there um, for the most selective schools. Sometimes, you know, that can give or take. You know, many of the students who apply to these schools are going to be the valedictorian and salutatorian. What we don't have on here is many valedictorians and salutatorians won't get accepted, too. Um, and the average test scores are going to be quite high. In the SATs, they're going to be well into the 1500s. In the um, ACT, they're usually going to be 34 or above. So that just gives you a little frame of really the numbers of what we're talking about here because I think it's important to know that because what Bob and I see is they're also our students we're in a culture where everyone who has good grades sometimes wants to apply to these schools it's helpful to kind of understand kind of the gates also and to understand the parameters now in addition I think I've already kind of hit this slide on terms of the second read the majority of the, um, one thing I'll say about rigorous coursework. So some high schools don't offer a lot of rigorous coursework. And so that can be difficult for a student. One thing that we're seeing more and more students do who can't get the rigor in their high school is taking college classes. And so I think that if your student is really having trouble getting rigor in their high school or they're so far ahead, like sometimes we have students who are two years ahead in math, three years ahead in math, and so it's really hard to find a course, then one of the things you can do is begin to take some additional coursework, even at a community college, is definitely going to help the student. Lisa, we have a couple of questions come up on the sure. academic side, and I wonder if you can tackle them. The first question that has come up is um, the age-old question about language, language requirements and calculus. Could you speak to those two items? Absolutely. I would say most students who are going to apply to highly selective schools should take calculus. There, I would give a few exceptions. Um, if a student is, say, really um, heavy in the humanities and so they're taking additional languages and additional humanities, they could get by not, not taking calculus, but I think it's a pretty big expectation. So I, I think that's a little dicey. I think the language requirement is you absolutely need three and you may need four, depending on what you wanna study. Um, four is kind of the, you know, what you're going for here is doing the highest level of study that you can. Now where I see the language not being, not, it's not particularly important to go over three, is for those STEM students who are really adding on additional math classes, additional science classes, if your school offers computer science, engineering, so that they're really taking their major related things. I have not seen that hurt students. So one of the things you have to ask yourself when you're making academic decisions, because all the bright kids that are applying to these colleges have a bazillion things they want to take. It's always a trade-off, right? And so I think what you have to say is, does this make sense for what I want to study? Now, if a student is going to a more liberal arts curriculum school, they need both of those things. They need four years of a language and they need to go through calculus. And calculus AB for the non-STEM um, non student is absolutely fine. Lisa, a couple of um, parents noted that their student attends a school that doesn't offer either AP courses or IB courses, and they wondered, will that put their student at a disadvantage? No, absolutely not. Every admissions person is going to tell you that they read your file, the student's file, in context to your school. So they're only looking for you to do what was available to you, okay? So absolutely not. And I have actually seen that play out in a number of times. But I would say 
to be competitive, at a minimum, the student, most high schools will offer some sort of dual credit with the community college option. And while if you had, if, we, if I were to put these in order, IB is the, mo is the most challenging and the most, the most highly respected curriculum, then AP, and then dual credit. But if you don't have the option of IB or AB, AP, then I think trying dual credit or taking some community college courses is going to be a really good way to show that you went for additional rigor. Uh, and then the last question, uh, one parent noted that she's very familiar with holistic review, but she's unfamiliar with this idea of a second read. A, is that unique to the highly selective schools? And B, is there a difference in the type of person that's doing a second read? Great question. Okay, we're going to get in the weeds here, and I'm going to try not to go too far in the weeds. I'm giving a general overview that most colleges have some checks and balances in their admissions reading. And so there's the first person who reads it, which traditionally has been the regional rep, although that's changed. And then there's usually one other person. Every college has their own system for this. There's now group reads. There's all these different ways to read applications. But it would be very, I, I can't think of a place where there, only one person would see the student's application. That, that is unusual. And then sometimes if they get to that second one and they can't decide, like the two people don't agree, then um, that goes to what we call committee, okay? And that's the admissions committee that you, like if you, ever watch admissions movies or whatever you see them around the mahogany table that's that group every application doesn't go before the committee um or it goes before the committee as a stamp but if the decision's already been made but if it's on the line it will go before the committee but what i would say is you guys don't need to worry too much about that because um the what you're trying to present is the same, no matter how they read it, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, and then the last question on academics, I know it's an area that a number of questions have come up. Uh, one of the other parents noted that they are, their student is at a high school that has both honors and high honors. And the question they have is they've been told students have to be on high honors. Is that true? Well, I don't know your school, so so I, it's a little bit hard for me to say. Um, the stu I mean, you can kind of calculate how many students are in high honors and how large is that graduating class. Um, you know, the ideal spot to be in would be about in the top five to seven percent. I mean, that would be ideal. So I would guess at most schools that probably is high honors. Um, I think my experience at the schools that I've worked with is for that there tends to be a very large group of kids that crowd honors. In other words, it's a lot more students who are in honors than high honors. And so it's harder to differentiate yourself academically. I think for students at most schools where they have high honors, that's a, that's a pretty significant break, if that makes sense. But I wouldn't call that necessarily a hard and fast rule. Great. Um, Lisa, could you wrap us up on this section by talking about that unique college admissions um, phrase that is intellectual curiosity? Sure. So I think if we were to say the one kind of unifying theme that rep is a student who is going to be, you know, a good candidate for a, a highly selective school, it's a student who on their own seeks out intellectual curiosity. So I don't believe, and I, I think Bob and I would agree on this, that if, if, if someone comes to meet with us and they're like, oh, can you help my student become, you know, a great candidate for X college. No, not unless your student already has some of these qualities, right? Like they have to come to the table with some of this. And the reason that's so important is 
Otherwise, that may not actually be the right college for them. So that's not a that's not a negative on them. So when we say intellectual curiosity, it's that student that, and it doesn't all have to be the same thing. If a STEM student's intellectual curiosity is going to learn look much different than a history student or an international relations student, but that in certain areas they have that. Today I was just working with the student before I started this and she just lit up. I just love to learn and you could just see it all over everything she does, you know, that has to kind of be the starting point. It's, you can't, it's hard to jumpstart that in a student that they kind of come that way. Great. Before we jump to the next section on what depth means to a college, I'll ask our colleague, Virginia Woodruff. Virginia, are there any general questions that have come up? Uh, that Lisa hasn't covered in this section. Someone asked, I see um, that someone has asked, um, can you get a copy of the slide deck? Yes, absolutely, we'll send that. Um, and then there's a few student specific questions on here. Um, Right, like what's the difference between generating a, uh, taking a class that would have a transcript and one online that would not have a transcript? Oh, great question. Well, that depends what the goal, what your goal is. Um, Bob will talk about this a little bit in, when he gets to the activity section. Um, I would say that if your goal is to show intellectual curiosity, you don't necessarily need a goal. You don't necessarily need a grade if you can speak about what you learned. If you're if you're able to kind of you know get that out in your resume or in an essay or something like that. I think there is right now a little bit of a movement among colleges are a little refreshed, if you will, by the classes like Coursera, edX, those kinds of things because colleges aren't a big fan of pay to play. In other words, go drop a ton of money and, and do some big program, you know? So even if you get a grade with that, now I would say a great option can be to go take a, you know, four credit class at a college. I've also seen that backfire on students. So I think you have to be careful because I've seen students bite off more than they can chew and then that that grade sits with them because that grade is coming with you. Um, so I kind of think that really depends on what the goal is of that coursework. I would say for the student who maybe is homeschooled or doesn't have a lot of rigor in their own high school, going and taking a course with a grade might be an advantage for them to prove that they can do the rigor. Great. That second question was about subject tests and their importance uh, now with COVID-19 going on. Yeah, and we'll address that towards the end when we kind of address the, um, the COVID questions. Great. Before we jump to this next stage of, about depth and college, we'd like to get a feel for who's joining us this evening so we can make sure we're talking about this in terms of the right class. So I'm going to launch a quick poll and I'm gonna ask you if you can to just let us know which graduating class your student is in. Great, so we have a really good feel for this. I think it's fair to say that um, more than half of the folks who are joining us this evening have students that are rising seniors. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this in terms of where the student is currently, and then the next three to four months in terms of how their story will extend. Um, and let's start, if we can, um, with this sense of, um, of what does depth mean? And um, uh, depth is, I think, for um, many of us as adults who applied to college decades ago, is an unfamiliar term. We're used to that great term that is a well-rounded student. These highly selective schools, because they're inundated with students who are applying, can afford to look for both breadth, that well-rounded student, and depth. 
And so many of you that um, have students that are working with us have seen this model that College Match Point has developed and utilized repeatedly. Um, we feel like that a student has to be at the core of this. This isn't a recipe. This isn't gaming or optimizing an application. That a student's depth has to come from their aptitude, their skills, and their motivation. For those of you that have freshmen and sophomores, or rising freshmen or sophomores, those are great years to engage on interest and involvement. For a student to reflect on what areas of interest, what skills do they have, and where do they want to experiment and begin to get involved. But because so many of you on this um, webinar have students who are rising seniors, the two words to watch there are initiative and impact. A student stepping into an area that they're involved in and taking initiative, and then a student looking at the communities that she might be involved in and looking at the lasting impact she has in those communities. And in terms of that, we really want to draw a contrast here between involvement, which is super important. It is a great foundation throughout high school. Um, it's so important for a student to be involved in things that connect to their interest. But we do really want to draw attention just as stark as the contrast is that Lisa drew on the academics, the contrast is stark in terms of students who've shown initiative on their resume, in their essays, on their activity summaries. They're showing that they took an idea and they made it a reality. And then when you talk to admissions directors about what made the difference between students who were all truly extraordinary, they come back to this idea of impact. What is different because of the students' ideas, their actions, and their questions? Now, what we thought we'd do is give you some um, very specific examples. These are students that we've worked with over the last 12 years that we've sort of anonymized some of the areas but really trying to understand. So you talk about this idea of initiative. What does it mean? And you can see that this really spans academic areas. You might have a student who's interested in history travel and they've created a vlog that has thousands of followers. You might have a student who has um, developed a college level course, not just taken it, but developed a college level course as an independent project. We would make one comment here that some of the um, very competitive schools increasingly are saying how impressed they are when a student does an independent project or a capstone project. Now, if that's initiative, let's talk for a minute about what we mean by impact. That student who created the blog, that student may have then ended up engaging with a TV producer who then hired the student to work on a new TV series. That student who created a brand new event for the nonprofit that they're a part of may have raised over $100,000 and that uh, fundraiser may be the signature annual event for the program. Now I know when I look at this as someone who graduated from high school decades ago, it really amazes me that there are students that are this deeply engaged and showing this kind of impact. But it is to say that the highly selective colleges, because they have so many students that have passed that first read, are keenly interested in the student's story that's told and the examples of specific impact and initiative that the student shows. They're always impressed with involvement. But at the end of the day, if they're able to understand a student's story in terms of the initiative they took and in terms of the impact they had, no matter the community or the school they're involved in, these highly selective colleges are particularly focused on that because frankly, they can afford to given the caliber and volume of students who apply to their school. Um, but we want to always give tangible examples. Um, many students that we work with have applied to MIT, your classic highly selective college. MIT four years ago 
codified this idea of initiative and impact by asking students to submit and then giving them an option to submit what they call a maker portfolio. They wanna see not just the student's outcome, not just the output of that project or that independent project, but they really wanna get a sense of how the student learned. They wanna see the sketches. At MIT now affords um, students the opportunity to upload images and videos about the project in process, not just the end result, but the various stages that the student went through in developing that app, in creating that device, in really showing academic initiative, the intellectual curiosity that Leisha showed, and ultimately the impact that an MIT expects when they really are down to a committee read and trying to decide among six truly extraordinary candidates. Now, before we talk, before Lisa talks about the importance of an application strategy, Virginia, are there questions that have come up at a high level in terms of what depth means? No, it seems like we have answered all of those questions. Great. So Lisa, do you want to take us through why an applica application strategy is so important? Absolutely. And one thing I'll say um, backward, Bob was talking about um, MIT for a second, that just to reiterate, even for other colleges, one of the things that is important with your student is what how are they going to hold whatever projects they're doing so that they can sort of tell the arc of their learning? So that might be a blog, it might be a GitHub account if they're a STEM student. Um, some students do things on Instagram, but something ultimately that they might be able to link to becomes really, really important um, for many schools and is a great way to highlight what the student has done. All right, so let's talk about application strategy. We've got a lot, over half of you have students who are applying to college right now. And I think if there is one thing that is sometimes puzzling and confusing to um, families, because it's changed so much from when we all went to college, is what in the world like makes a great college essay? The most important thing in a college essay is that it shows reflection by the student, that you can sort of see inside the student and what's important to them. And the student is the key to the story. Now, what's going to happen for many um, of the students applying to highly selective schools is that rather than being the center of their story, they're going to want to tell about something. They're used to sharing knowledge, very bright students. So they're going to be tempted to want to talk about something rather than really showing themselves. So, you know, one of the things you hear in all college essay stuff that gets kind of old is show, don't tell. But it, this is not the point at which a student is teaching someone about something. It's telling how something impacted them. And the story, or what I would call the frame of the essay, isn't really the most important piece of it. I mean, I always share a story of a young man that worked with us who just swept all the ivies. And his essay was about cooking with his grandfather, but he told us so much about himself in that essay, and it was just effortless to read. So reflection, and many of these kids are not particularly used to having to reflect on themselves. And so one of the things that we have to work with students on is helping them develop maybe some new muscle that they haven't. Um, the other thing that's really changed and keeps changing every year, I'm kind of shocked, is the amount of writing that a student who's applying to highly selective college is going to do. Um, at, all students are gonna have, you know, it's like, wait, I thought I just have one college essay and I send it to everybody. That's the starting point. That's the 
piece of writing that I'm talking about that needs to be really reflective. It would almost be like, I'm going to learn about you if I was going to sit down and talk to you and you were going to tell me a story about your life and how important it was to you. Then there's many other essays. So an, an average student applying to highly selective colleges is going to write about 14 essays. They're not all the same length, but that's a lot of writing. There are ways to kind of reuse that writings and retool it, um, but it's not an insignificant amount of writing. And I think as adults in the student's life, one of the important things, a lot of times we do these sessions, we'll take a poll of how many, we just had one not too long ago, we took a poll on the parents, how many, of, how many essays did they write? And the average was three. So having a little bit of empathy with the students about how, how challenging this can be, I think it is really important. Um, the essay needs to be something that only this student could write. It's so specific and it's so personal that there's no way anyone else could write it. That can be challenging for some students. They want to say, it was the greatest day ever. It was the most fun I ever had, you know, like generic kind of um, cliche. And so honing in to take risks, to show vulnerability. And I think a, a kind of, um, Achilles heel, if you will. There's a couple of Achilles heels for the, the, you know, the exceptional student in the writing process. One is that I want to write what I think you want to hear. So it sounds kind of stiff and not terribly personal. And the other is I'm really smart and I'm going to let you know how smart I am but I don't actually get to know the student. So this is personal. Um, and then the additional essays that the students write are typically um, about um, like why a certain school, about, um, you know, all sorts of things. What, why do you want to study what you want to study? Um, what kind of community member are you? And I think we're going to see more of that. I think colleges right now, I think we were already building up to this, but I think we're at a moment where colleges want to know that they're bringing in students who are resilient, flexible, kind. So I think that's those things are also going to be very important to show in some of the supplemental essays. One other comment on the second Achilles heel that Lisa mentioned is what we sometimes call the curse of the creative that student who is an extraordinarily gifted creative writer, might even be a student who's a debater. In some ways they have to unlearn all those flourishes, all those aspects that made them such a talented creator, because that can get in the way of them telling a story that is specific or personal. And a second derivation of that curse of the creative is when a parent is a creative writer or a marketing communications person, and they look at these essays as a marketing tool, not as a personal essay that oftentimes can take risk and show vulnerability. All right, so we're talking about all this activity, and I think that it's always important for you to kind of know ahead of time like what's this actually going to look like on an application? So our slide shows you the common application and how students are list these activities. The reason we like to show this is look how small this is. They're going to do all this great stuff and they get 10 of these slots to tell what they were and a tiny little amount about that activity. So in this, the ability to be concise and pick the right things to talk about grew at 35 members it's always going to be about they put the impact right there i found it and i grew it so how one addresses these activities does become important and oftentimes we have a big old whiteboard on the board with the student because obviously a lot of times we have to knock things off which is always a little bit disappointing um, and pick those most important things and on the common application if there's any students on here, this is something that students often miss. Those are supposed to be in order of importance to you. So that, that is important that your the college is reading as, you know, foreign language is the number one most important thing to this student who's the president of the Classics Club. Now, how else can we get some more information in here? That becomes the question, right? Because colleges say, hey, we really want everything in the application. 
a part of the puzzle that we often use, you've got to use it carefully or, or, or it can be a mistake. There is an additional section on the application called additional information, which is an additional 650 words, which you can put anything in there. Now, I think this is a fantastic place to highlight any research that the student has done. If it's like Bob said, like a self-generated project or an independent work. Um, it also can be a great thing if like, say the student is applying to business, for example, and they have a number of really robust things that they've done in business. And it really doesn't fit over there in the activities. The student could write a short, I mean like, five to seven sentences about why they're drawn to business and then kind of do blocks that give a little more information about what they've done. While you certainly can write another essay, you need to be careful here and make sure you're giving something that's relevant that they're not gonna find anywhere else that will actually help the reader. So if you just were to write a second essay, that's making the reader take more time. And sadly, a reader's gonna spend about eight minutes on this whole thing, including the essay. So they're rocking through this thing. So we wanna give them, it's better here most of the time, not always, but most of the time, to give them something that's bulleted versus like a lot of verbiage. But this is a really good spot. Most students don't use it. Now then, I, I may have to enter the COVID world at this point, but um, historically is how I'll go right now. Um, there are, have been a number of different ways to apply to highly selective schools. Early decision, which is binding and can increase admit rates at many schools by 2X or 3X, so a lot. Some schools, not as much, um, but in general, can give you kind of a nice bump. The more selective you get, the less bump you're gonna get, okay? So when we get up into the Ivies, we're not gonna see quite as big a bumps as we're gonna see. At what we call the drool schools, those schools like Northwestern, Vanderbilt, those schools right under there, um, Wash U, those schools, you're gonna see Tufts, you're gonna see a pretty big bump there. Some of them do early decision, which is binding. Some of them do restricted early action, which is means that you can't apply to any other private schools in an early round. So no other, and early action, the difference with early action, restricted early action, is that um, it is not binding, okay? So you can still apply typically although you have to read the rules of the school you're applying to, to your state college. So for example, for people in Texas, you could go on and apply to UT in August and still apply to a restricted early action school. I think we have pretty much eliminated any just straight out early actions in the highly selective schools. I do anticipate a lot of this changing this year a little bit, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So you've got your two early rounds. Those are typically due November 1st. And then you have your regular decision, which is I'm gonna apply to all these schools, see who lets me in, and then decide where I'm going to go. And those are typically due January 1st. Lisa, we've had a quick question before we wrap up this section with Virginia's question on this slide. And that is the parent saying, well, I've heard the only way to get a highly selective uh, admit is a student going early decision, that no one ever gets into a highly selective school through regular decision. That is, that is the word on the street. And, and, I, and I mean, we do have that conversation with students about, you know, how much it can bump up. But I will tell you, you guys that Many of our early kids, uh, I mean, our, our highly selective students, you know, every year I have two or three where at the end of the early round, like maybe they did apply early decision and they didn't get in there, but then they turn around and do really amazing with like a ton of highly selective options at regular decision. So, you know, when we get in these percentages, it's really hard to know who's going to read what. And I think there is this, it's such a qualified applicant pool at early decision. And it also is athletes and it also is legacies that 
the 2x and 3x is inflated, it's always a little hard to know how inflated, right? Um, Early decision is great for the student that knows that is their dream school, they want to go there, and they're actually admissible. In other words, they really do have the, the, um, the background to potentially be, be considered. I think early decision is a really bad idea for what we call an extreme reach. In other words, I'm just throwing the football down the, yard, down the lane, even though my transcript doesn't read like this and my test scores that's not a good idea. Kids don't feel good about that afterwards. Um, so I, I think you want to use early decision for schools that the student actually really loves and can imagine themselves at and that they, I don't mean that they're going to get in for sure, but I mean that they are, they fall within the range of that school. Great. Uh, one last um, question that always comes up, Lisa, and that is, what does optional mean? Well, I would say in most cases, optional means do it. Like there are very few things. Kids always say, oh yeah, I don't want to write that, that essay because it actually says I don't have to, it's optional. The college, you want to get accepted by this college. So nothing is optional. Now, um, I would say this year, we're going to have an essay about COVID that I believe is truly optional. I think if the student's family has actually been impacted or the student thinks they have something significant to say about this time and their impact and maybe a good lens to look through that is, you know, was it unique, you know, um, to them? Because obviously all of us have, everyone has, has had difficult times during COVID. Um, then I think a student would answer that, but I don't, that would be the one time where I would say that optional is actually truly optional. Virginia, are there any questions that are broad that have come up that we haven't addressed in this section in terms of the importance of an application strategy? No, we don't have any broad questions at this time. Great. So we thought we'd wrap up this evening with disruptions, disruptions, disruptions. And it really is the tale of two application seasons for the highly selective schools. Pre-COVID, highly selective schools continued to remain extremely competitive. There were minor changes in a school maybe going up a point or down a point, but overall the median admit rate across these 3% of schools really did not change. One thing that did change at a number of schools is that the number of early decision applications declined. And what we're beginning to see at those schools is a reconsideration of early decision in their strategy. And then the last piece, and it's the reason why we asked that poll question, is that we really saw over and over again that the students who were fully engaged in high school from freshman year through senior year, both in the classroom and out of the classroom, are the students who really had success in their applications. And that conversely, those students that tried to shoehorn it all into their junior year with activity after activity, with all AP courses and 20 different subject tests, it really wasn't enough because it didn't show the spread across the three and a half years of high school. Now, we could spend an entire seven hour webinar and no one would want to survive that on the impact of COVID for these highly selective schools. Now, for the class of 2020, those students who just graduated from high school, they experienced a once in a generation most likely wait list impact. There were students who massively saw wait list offers they saw schools contact them and ask them, can you make a decision? I've taken you off my wait list and you have 28, uh, 24 or 48 hours. So while the admissions rates remained pretty comp uh, consistent, the utilization of wait list post COVID, I mean, post the quarantine was substantial and far reaching. And it has not stopped. We continue to hear from students who have been offered coming off the wait list at highly selective colleges. 
We've also seen, because of COVID, a shift to what the admissions lead at the University of Texas at Austin has characterized as retail admissions. Even the most highly selective schools embracing online as an opportunity to both present and market their school, but also offering deep one-on-one -on -one engagement opportunities. We've seen Georgetown, for instance, offer students the opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with faculty members and with students at their school. And we anticipate this shift to be a constant shift going forward. Now, for the students who are rising seniors, the class of 2021, the most significant impact of COVID that we've seen is test optional. Now, we've heard stories over the last six, uh, few weeks of students so frustrated trying to find a test slot for the ACT or the SAT. And as a result, many of the highly selective colleges have switched to test optional. Just this morning, the last Ivy League college, Princeton, switched to test optional. So all the Ivy Leagues and Stanford are now test optional. <clears throat> In addition, um, Princeton was both last to the test optional bus, but first to a change in their deadlines. Princeton announced a single January 1st deadline, and we anticipate this to most likely be the next wave of changes as schools consider, do they wanna alter their deadlines and do they want to consider offering different application horizons in terms of early decision or restricted early action? Lisa mentioned a couple of minutes ago the COVID-19 prompt, and that's on the Common App. For the class of 2021, the other change that we've seen, and we covered this in a webinar a couple of months ago, is the radical reset of this summer's plans. Students who had internships planned, students who had um, independent studies planned. Now, what we hear from colleges that are highly selective is they're very aware that students' summer plans were changed. And what they're keenly interested in is what did you do in response to that change? We know that you and all the other applicants to our school had to reset their summer. We're now super interested in how did you reset? And we work with countless students who spent April and May identifying what were the activities that they wanted to be engaged in that both connected to their aptitudes and motivations, but also allowed them to show initiative and impact this summer. Now, we really want to sort of end with a sense of, for all parents, whether or not your student is a rising freshman to soon to be a graduating senior a year from now, in the three stages of this, what should you do and what should you not do? For those rising freshmen and sophomore where the focus is high school engagement, make sure you're working from a plan that focuses on breadth and depth Make sure you're building a portfolio of experiences and outcomes. When you choose classes, choose them for rigor. And one intangible, and Lisa talked about this in the essays, in the essay discussion, it is crucial that a student develop self-reflection muscles. We see students straining in that summer between junior and senior year when they're writing essays to magically create their own self-reflection muscles, and it's brutal. Now, a couple of don'ts as it relates to high school engagement. Do not think there is one recipe. We hear over and over again from parents and students, well, I have a friend that did this, then did this, then did this, and they got into Princeton. And our answer is always, that's their story, what's yours? And then finally, as we said before, don't wait until your junior year. For rising uh, juniors or for seniors still thinking about their college list, start with a criteria, not a shopping list. Don't just come in and say, well, here are the 36 highly selective schools, and I'm just trying to figure out which of these 
36 should I apply to? I think I want three. And we oftentimes find that students who are applying to highly selective schools sometimes struggle with owning the rest of their list, the possibles and the matches. And that speaks to a don't, and that is don't build a list that is all reaches. Don't build a list that is all extreme reaches. Now, on the essay and application, this really recaps a lot of what Lisa has commented on before. We do want to raise one piece of gentle counsel to parents on this call. It doesn't take a village to write college admissions essays, nor does it take a family. It takes a student. And we find the temptation to crowdsource an essay with not only a mother or a father or a partner or a guardian, but aunts and uncles all chiming in on that essay can really lessen the student's voice. And to be clear, that impact is something that admissions readers can note immediately. So we just want to stress how crucial it is, particularly for students applying to highly selective schools, that the voice be their own, and that the process allows them to dive deep into telling that story and it not to be a family activity or to be an activity that broadly includes everyone who's ever known the student. Now, well, before we wrap up, Virginia, are there any questions that have come up that we haven't been able to address this evening? Excuse me, Bob, I have one because the, uh, someone had a question that I actually had to check myself and make sure I had the right information. Um, so someone asked what percentage of students at highly selective schools are first generation? I had to look it up. It's about 16% if I kind of averaged them together there. And I just wanted to look that up for um, to make that clear. There's also one point I want to make about test optional because I think there is a lot of confusion about test optional. Test optional is not test blind. Test blind would mean we just aren't going to look at scores at all. If you guys have really been following your college nerd news, you'll know that the University of California system is headed towards test blind, where they're not looking at it, going to look at ACTs and SATs in, I think it's the class of 2025. Test optional means you can send a score or you cannot send a score. For students whose scores represent them well, they should still send their scores. For students who are great test takers, if they get the opportunity to take subject tests, they should take them. And if the scores are good, they should send them. Now, the student who probably benefits the most from test optional is I'm a really good student, I have a really great resume, and I am not a great test taker. Well, this class of 2021, I think there is an opportunity there for the student not to submit scores. And one question that's been coming to me a lot from my clients, so I'm just gonna assume that some of you probably have it, is just because you took the test, you don't have to send the test. You Optional means optional. You can send it or you cannot send it. So I just wanted to clarify that because I think testing, as Bob said, if there's one part of this that has really just been super difficult for this class, that is probably it. The other thing I just wanted to mention is we do have opportunities on our website um, for summer if there's people who are still looking for summer opportunities. Um, and I think there are a couple more questions, aren't there, Virginia? Yeah, there was one more question which was about for this class of 2021, um, is it going to be more competitive? Are they competing with students who have taken a gap year this year? Gosh, that is the $50 million question, and I wish I could answer it. Here's my personal thinking, which, and, and a lot of others in the admissions world, my guess is it's not going to hurt them. We're looking at a really large percentage. You know, most colleges have got about a 15% international population, which is likely not to be joining campus, likely for, you know, a couple of cycles. So probably everything kind of evens out. I also think that we are seeing some retraction in terms around the highly selectives in terms of people reconsidering their state colleges because of the financial you know, climate that we're in as a country. So my guess is at the end of the day, it kind of evens out. 
we're just going to have to see, I, I, which I know is like the ultimate COVID answer. But um, my general gut is that's probably not going to be a huge issue. But I could be wrong on that. Um, I see another question about, um, does test optional hurt kids with high test scores? No, I think that's never been a great, it's never been, I mean, if you have a, a high test score and you already have it on the books, I think it's a way maybe to differentiate yourself a little bit. I would say if you have, um, if you're outside the middle 50% of that college, you probably should not submit your test score. So uh, we sure appreciate everybody taking time out of their evening. As Lisa mentioned, a large percentage of students that we work with who apply to highly selective schools have University of Texas at Austin as a possible on their list. Uh, we're updating our guide to UT Austin next week. For those of you that have rising ninth or 10th graders and are beginning to look at how would they design their ninth or 10th grade around this idea of engagement, around involvement, initiative, and impact? In early August, we'll be hosting webinars on designing your year for ninth graders and designing your year for 10th graders. We'll share information on both of these in our follow-up email early next week. And that follow-up email will also inc include a recorded version of this webinar. We sure appreciate your time this evening. We hope you and your family stay well. Be sure to wear that mask. And we hope you and your students have a wonderful summer.